Under these peaceful Scottish waters lie the graves of 50 mighty warships, all lost to the depths in a matter of hours. The sight is indescribable. The water was one mass of wreckage. It was an enormous sight of confusion. Seven known wrecks remain, but there's much more to be discovered. A hundred years later, unseen before, we're actually seeing the marks of that um, still in the seabed today. It's just big engineering, it's huge. It's crazy to see these things just sitting there on the seabed. With new technology, archeologists can now get a much deeper understanding of what happened here in a way that's never been possible before. Three million shipwrecks lost in the depths of the ocean. There's the bow. Wow, she's pretty. Each a time capsule hiding stories of adventure, innovation. The number of holes in that wreck is quite remarkable. Courage and tragedy. We're talking about the deaths of 10,000 people. Now the hunt is on to find the ships unlock their secrets. Imagine being in a haunted house with a small flashlight. It's sinking! That I lost my hold and fell. It was a terrible crash at the vessel side. I was the only one to come back. Others sank to the bottom. And hear their voices once again. Marine archaeologist Dr. Ennis McCartney is in the far north of Scotland in a natural harbor called Scapa Flow, the most important British naval base in both world wars. In 1919, it was also home to an enormous armada of German warships, which then sank. This whole area where we are was full of warships. We are actually in what was effectively Battleship Alley right here, and uh, in, in front of me were the Lions battle cruisers, and beyond that were 50 destroyers all lined up in double rows going down the islands there. Ennis and a team of experts are carrying out the first ever comprehensive study of these waters. Commissioned by the Sea Museum Jutland in Denmark and based on the museum's high-tech survey vessel, MV Vina. There's been limited survey in this area but it is only covering a small fraction of the entire German fleet anchorage. And so where we're going to start work tomorrow is in an area which has never been previously surveyed in any form of detail. They have just 10 days to uncover 12 square miles to record the seven known wrecks in more detail and anything else that might remain of the German fleet. And it's our expectation that we're going to see a hell of a lot of material down there that we're then going to have to decipher what it is. It's an ambitious task, and to carry it out, the team is deploying the latest video and scanning technology. So the way Vina works with the survey is to put in run lines, which is like mowing the lawn. The ship just goes up and down on a set of predetermined lines. Uh, effectively using the uh, the beams from the multi-beam just to paint in the seabed and as the lines expand we get a we get a map a high resolution map of um, whatever's down there underwater wrecks will always deteriorate so it is important for Ennis to record what still survives helping with the investigation is naval historian Nick Jellico Orkney is a very, very special place for me. I mean, it's where my grandfather spent the first two years of his First World War uh, in command of the Grand Fleet. And the Grand Fleet was uh, anchored here as the northernmost base of the, of the British military. They locate one of the seven main wrecks, the Markgraf, and prepare to dive it from the support vessel, Karen. Just to inform you, diving operations about to start on the mark graph. We're about two or three minutes from sight now. Five minutes for a pre-breathe? Yeah, OK, Dan, no problem. Rather than just looking at a multi-beam of the ship, we're actually going to see up close what they see through their cameras they're taking down there. 
After a hundred years underwater, she's covered in marine growth. Visibility's not very good down there. When you can only see that much of it, and it just keeps going and keeps going and keeps going, you get a clue as to just how big these things are. It's just an amazing sight. It's a, it's a privilege to be there. Well, she's so easy to swim into, then not she? Really, it's really dangerous now. You can easily go in, in underneath and not know it. The Markgraf was one of the best fighting ships in the German fleet. The vessels of the German high seas fleet were among the most modern and powerful vessels of their time. So how did this formidable fleet end up in the remote waters of Scapa Flow? On November 11th, 1918, a ceasefire was called. But World War I couldn't officially end until a peace treaty was negotiated and signed. Well, the fact of the matter was that the Allies were agreed on most of the negotiating points with Germany at Versailles. One of the major things they disagreed on, though, was how to deal with the German Navy. Uh, the Americans wanted it destroyed. The French actually wanted their share. So did the Italians, so did the Japanese. The British didn't want to do that. They didn't want to make another uh, Navy more powerful. It was too risky to leave the fleet in Germany as Allies deliberated its fate. So the ships needed to be temporarily interned under constant supervision. But nobody wanted them. And so it finally came down to, to Britain saying, right, we will take the intern fleet. Uh, we'll put them in Scapa Flow where we can keep an eye on them. The crews of 74 of Germany's best ships, stripped of all their weapons, sail north for internment. They get to the rendezvous point, and there is practically every ship in the British Isles all lined up. Uh, to receive the German fleet. They met the full force of the Grand Fleet together with French and American warships armed to their teeth. And so this defenseless fleet almost had to run the gauntlet. This was meant as a humiliation and this was understood as a humiliation. There they came in the poor light of a grey November morning and surrounded us from all sides, squadron upon squadron. The realization that we were now coming under the British yoke jarred on our nerves. The German warships were inspected to make sure all guns were fully disabled. Then a fleet that once set out to challenge the Royal Navy sailed into the home of its greatest enemy. One by one, the privileges and rights that one would have expected to have had as an internee were stripped away, and the realization came that they were little more than prisoners. They weren't allowed to move off their ships. They bartered with islanders to get basic things like sort of soaps and toothpaste. As the politicians in France continued to argue, the German crews were getting restless. And for Rear Admiral von Reuter, who was in charge of the interned fleet, there was a bigger concern. The thought begins to emerge. The British are going to board our vessels and take them away from us. And that's simply not going to be allowed to happen. These were incredibly valuable vessels, especially the Markgraf, which now lies at the bottom of the flow. Dan is analyzing details of her wreck. She is a fantastic dive. Unfortunately, the vis wasn't, wasn't very good, mm -hmm. but the first thing we, we came across that's a wonderful example of is, is the armor plating. You can see it here in this, this sort of uh, how, almost how L thick is, How thick is this plating here? Um, it looked about that thick. Yeah. Not much thicker than that. It's still, it's still a lot of steel. Still a lot of steel, yeah. 
but uh, you can see here from this is the the, the lower slab yeah and it's the, it's come away it's now clean fallen away and, and reveal the actual hull underneath. Right, right, right. And at the yeah. at the very end here, mm -hmm. you can also see where the rivets were onto the other plate. Ah, and it's just ripped away. This and is it, this is one rip, and that's yeah. it. It's just folded like that. It's just torn them apart yeah, yeah. that way yeah. and pulled the rivets out of their right, right. other holes. That's why you end up with this jagged tooth look to it. Right, right. But no torpedo or shell from an enemy ship caused this. The damage is from a century of corrosion and salvage. So what happened during her final moments afloat? After nearly seven months of internment, a deadline for the peace treaty was set for June 21st. I was certain that the English admiral would take possession of the German ships on the day the preliminary peace was signed. With no word from his seniors in Germany, Von Reuter took matters into his own hands and delivered a message to his crews. A demand for the surrender of any ship by the English, unless with my express approval, is to be regarded as a forcible attempt at seizure and therefore to be answered by the scuttling of the ship. Von Reuter's clandestine plan was to scuttle the entire German fleet and in doing so, prevent Allied forces from seizing it. But with the British Navy guarding them day and night, how could such an ambitious plan be put into action? The Marine research team has surveyed and dived the wreck of the SMS Markgraf, one of the many at Scapa Flow in Scotland. Dan is analyzing his dive footage in more detail. So your sea level would have probably been around here. Okay. Um, and just above this, you then start finding portholes. Right. I think divers have been there over the years, have taken away the portholes on these ones, hmm. but further along, um, here's one with the actual glass porthole still in place. But it's open. It's wide open. Right. This ship did not sink following an attack. Her own crew succeeded in their plan to scuttle her. But how do they do it? under the eyes of the British guards. Just days before the June 21st peace treaty deadline, von Reuter secretly sent instructions to the German fleet. The sabotage is immediately to begin. Turbines to be rendered unfit. Gunnery and torpedo fittings to be destroyed. These preparations had to be done in utmost secrecy. Suddenly in Versailles, the June 21st deadline was extended, but no one told the Germans in Scapa Flow. So the only news he's getting from the outside world, apart from what the Navy tell him, are from newspapers that are arriving and they're four days out of date. As the morning of the 21st dawn, von Reuter was convinced that this would be his fleet's final day of freedom. But then, something incredible happened. And Volroyd is about to send out a momentous order to his entire fleet. He looks around, and the British have gone. His jailers turn their backs on him. The British Navy, already aware that the deadline shifted, sent most of its warships out of the harbor on a training exercise. Not well advised, to say the least. The German captains waited for the agreed coded message from von Reuter. Several men were running at top speed along the deck. Something must be wrong. Tensely, we read the signal. Confirm paragraph 11. He gave the agreed signal of paragraph 11 bestätigen. And this was a reference to the drinking code of German students, who simply meant keep on drinking. Keep on drinking means sink the fleet immediately. It was an enormous sight of confusion. You can imagine 2,000 sailors running around, throwing every kind of conceivable floatable object into the, into the bay. A local school group was out in the harbor, viewing the famous German warships. It slowly dawned on us that something extraordinary was happening and that the ships were actually beginning to sink. 
the handful of British officers who remained in the harbor were slow to react. I think it took some time till they actually reckoned that a scuttling was taking place. And probably this also explains the reaction of almost panicking. When the British did realize what was happening, they were confused. The British and, and Navy personnel that were here that came out on the drifters uh, started to shoot. And the machine guns were even used to, to try and coerce the Germans back onto their ships to try and save them. It was absolutely impossible at that point. There was no point in going on firing, yet what could we do? The whole thing has been a colossal disaster. By midday, Scapa Flow was filled with the sights and sounds of sinking ships. The British crews out training were ordered back to the harbor immediately. The sight that met our gaze as we rounded the island of Flotter is absolutely indescribable. A good half of the German fleet had already disappeared. The water was one mass of wreckage. On the Markgraf, the captain, Commander Schumann, was concerned for the safety of his crew. When the scuttling order is received, some of the crew are still down below trying to get their baggage and the rest. So even though the valves are opened and the ship begins to sink, he actually orders the scuttle to be suspended so he can make sure that his crew get out. Schumann thought that by delaying the sinking, he could give them time to get into the prepared lifeboats. But that delay has allowed the British to get into the fleet anchorage, and they're armed and they're angry. When Schumann emerged on the deck of the Markgraf, he was confronted by armed British sailors. Waving a white handkerchief, he tried to make the puffer cease fire. However, as soon as he became visible, he was under fire. And the third time, he was shot in the head and killed right away. Despite losing their captain, the Markgraf's crew completed their dangerous mission. We know that it rolled over onto its port side and disappeared that way. Um, what we see now on the seabed is a vessel that is almost completely upside down. The survey team records another wreck, SMS Kronprinz Wilhelm, with her control top and 12-inch guns clearly visible on the scans. Moving towards the southern end of the harbor, they launched their smaller research vessel, Limbo. The advantage of having Limbo is its ability to get into very shallow water. This is a scan that Limbo took yesterday on right on the top of the, um, the island of Farah. And what we're seeing here is a, a very clear groove um, in the, uh, the stones of the seabed in this area. And we know from archival research that um, during the Scala, one of the German torpedo boats was saved by the Royal Navy from sinking by being hauled up right at this location. With the help of the Limbo, Innes is able to record and produce unrivaled images of these archaeological remains. A hundred years later, unseen before, we're actually seeing the, um, the, the, the marks of that um, still in the seabed today. During the scuttle, the British prevented just 21 out of 50 torpedo boats from sinking. But there were also 24 giant warships here. Can Ennis and his research team use their technology to locate the vessels and enhance our understanding of history? Ennis and the team have now surveyed a large area of Scapa Flow and are building up a remarkable picture of what's hidden beneath the water. When this project's finished and we've mapped the entire fleet anchorage, we will have an unprecedented, um, fully detailed map of the whole of the, of the Grand Scuttle like it's never been previously seen. Um, it's, it's tremendously thrilling to have this, uh, this technology available to us because we can, we can study naval events from the bottom up. Um, instead of just being able, as, as in the past, to study them from the archive downwards. And putting the two together leads us to a, to a, a, a newer truth, which has been unavailable to us in the past. So far, 
they've scanned the wrecks of torpedo boats and a couple of larger warships. But there are over a dozen warships still unaccounted for. After surveying more of the seafloor, they scan another large wreck. It's the light cruiser SMS Kuhn. Diving the wreck shows her 5.9 inch guns and crow's nest. But the survey also reveals a concerning trend. What we're seeing is the existing warships that are left are now in uh, an increasing state of deterioration. And it's noticeable every year that you come and look at them, that they're, they're falling down. On the day of the scuttle, the German crews managed to sink an incredible 52 ships. This is an unprecedented event, an entire fleet being scuttled. The chaos, the confusion, the, the sheer spectacle of it all happening. But their success came at a price. It was quite obvious that the Huns would die to a man rather than save their ships. The British guards killed nine German sailors in all. They were the final fatalities of the First World War. This is really the last chapter of the First World War. These graves are the last visible signs of what went on here in 1919. The surviving German crews were eventually sent home to a hero's welcome. From the German point of view, they had saved the honor of the German Navy by scuttling their vessels rather than letting them fall into the enemy's hand. It was seen as the last successful act of defiance. For the British, the scuttle raised some difficult questions. The question that is always there in, in my mind is whether the, the British were in some way complicit with the German decision to actually scuttle and destroy their fleet. Admiral Fremantle, in command of the British Navy in Scapa Flow, later records. Minor occurrences and movements had been observed on board the German ships, which led me to suspect that some momentous action was contemplated by them. Many could see the benefits of the Germans destroying their own fleet. I look upon the sinking of the German fleet as a real blessing. It disposes once and for all the thorny question of the redistribution of these ships. What it meant for the British is it didn't have to give any ships to the French or to the Americans, and they didn't want to give up their superiority on the seas. No one has ever proven that the British government was complicit, and most historians believe that a mistake, rather than collusion, is the more likely explanation. In Scapa Flow, the survey continues, examining what remains and traces of what doesn't. The scan that we're seeing here is the the, the top end of the, the German fleet anchorage. And in every case, it's clear you, you, you have the, the imprint of the, uh, the ship now, now embedded forever in the seabed of the flow. Now, seven of these wrecks are still here, but all the others are just, are just the shadows of those former events. These shadows are imprints of the rest of the scuttled fleet. They were some of the largest warships in the world, and now, They've all but disappeared in the wake of a Herculean salvage effort. The research team at Scapa Flow is heading to what they believe is the resting place of one of the most iconic German ships scuttled here, the SMS Bayern. But this isn't your average wreck site. Definitely see where they ship used to be, there's a big sort of dip. Um, it's very light silt on top. Then you go down the dip and you can just see it's more shale and shale and, and so you know where it used to be. 
and then you just come across this massive great lump. You can see huge gearing that would have driven the turret around. Um, it looked like a massive battery. The Byron was one of the brand new 28,000 ton super dreadnoughts. Bayon and Baden are the two most powerful ships in the high seas fleet. These are the ships in the German fleet that have been fitted with 15 inch guns. They're the state of the art monster battleships of the high seas fleet. Dan has uncovered one of Bayern's massive gun turrets, but nothing else. It's just big engineering, it's huge. Where'd the battleship go? It's crazy. They see these things just sitting there on the seabed. Immediately after the scuttle, the British authorities had a new problem. All the wrecks made the harbor, the British Navy's key base, treacherous to navigate. Meanwhile, islanders looted whatever they could. Anything on a ship that came ashore, irrespective of the legality of it, was fair game as far as they were concerned. It's said that the boiler tubes, a lot of the German warships ended up being used as curtain rails in Orkney, so uh, there was a little bit of a bonanza going on. A company called Cox and Danks embarked on a large-scale salvage operation. Ernest Cox bought up a number of the sunken vessels, determined to raise them from the seafloor. At the time, one of Scotland's top salvage experts was Ian Murray Taylor's grandfather, Thomas Mackenzie. My grandfather um, was invited to become chief salvage officer to Cox because my grandfather had the technical expertise and Cox had the money and the nerve to risk his money on this enterprise. No one had ever attempted a salvage operation of this scale. Cox needed some heavy duty lifting here. He purchased a giant floating dock, essentially a platform that could be moved around to access ships on the seabed. Cox acquires this thing and has it cut in half longitudinally straight down the middle. So the two halves can be moved along over the top of one of the torpedo boats. Once the dock was in place, divers fed wires under the sunken ship and attached the ends to winches on the two halves of the dock. And this is a unique part. That normally, when you're using pontoons or using a floating dock as a pontoon, you'll tighten down the lifting wires at low tide, let the tide rise, and as the tide rises, you tow the ship into shallow water, and as soon as it grounds, you wait for the tide to fall, and you tighten up the wire ropes again, and do it in a series of tidal lifts. Cox and Danks augmented this by adding winches. The winches were fitted with hand cranks. By turning the cranks, workers tightened the wires lifting the ships. The vessel can be, can be winched to the surface by a combination of lifting by the tide and lifting by the hand cranks. This has never been done before. Uh, so very inventive. It was ingenious, but required a lot of manpower. So at a maximum, there was 60 men on each side, 120 men winding furiously and then collapsing on the deck, being absolutely worn out. Once raised, the wrecks were towed away and cut up for scrap. In less than three years, Cox and his chief salvager, Mackenzie, recovered 25 torpedo boats. He's a genius inventor in some ways, but he's carrying out salvage acts that were considered by many to be completely impossible. Um, and they're feeling their way with, with, with new ways and means of recovering the smaller destroyers and then and the larger warships all the time. The first large warship they tackled was the SMS Hindenburg. Unlike the torpedo boats, she was too heavy to be lifted by wires and winches alone. Hindenburg was sunk upright with her decks covered, and therefore the only method of raising that ship was to seal the decks and all the openings in the deck, funnels, portholes, and of course the bottom openings in the hull, and then pump the water out. 800 custom patches were applied to make the Hindenburg watertight. 
Then they began pumping water out of the hole. And that sounds quite logical and straightforward. But when they got to the ship half out of the water, they found that it kept on tilting to one side. And as they raised it further, it tilted further and further over. To solve this problem, the ship was resunk and a new strategy was enacted. The surveys uncovering wreckage from the secondary salvage attempts. But these aren't the remains of the battlecruiser. They're separate structures, which Cox and his team built specifically for this purpose. They made huge cement cradles, 25 feet by 30 feet, under the stern to hold the ship steady so that the ship would be resting on the stern while the bow was being pumped up and to keep the ship stable and stop it listing. After the cement was poured and reinforced with materials salvaged from other German ships, the cradle structure was ready to support the stern of the Hindenburg while the rest of the ship was raised up. Diving this structure also reveals a new insight into the construction of the German fleet. You can see this in museums and things. We never expect to see it in the sea, but the actual watertight spaces around the engine room on one of the Hindenburg wedges still contain the slats of wood that were in there. Studying the wood incorporated in the cradles more closely reveals it to be cork. Being buoyant, it is an ideal material to use at sea. No out of cork the German Navy must have purchased and used in the construction of the high seas fleet is just beggar's belief. Uh, there it was. The cost was nothing. The ships just had to be built in the best way possible. Once the troubled Hindenburg recovery was underway, they set their sights on an even bigger target, and the salvagers would invent new techniques to make sure they claimed this prize. At Scapa Flow in Scotland, the Marine Survey Team is creating a detailed map indicating the remains of the scuttled German fleet, along with the imprints of the vessels that were later salvaged. Two to three centimeter radius. Yeah. Yeah. That's just amazing. Yeah. This is like taking a photograph. Yeah, just like that. So the gray ones are the ones that are done, yeah? Yeah. And it says the green ones, so we are really getting there now. One meter there, we are. After a few false starts with the ongoing Hindenburg recovery efforts, Cox and his team turned to the larger ships deeper in the harbor. They hoped to raise these wrecks by pumping compressed air in rather than pumping seawater out, which presented a new challenge. The solution was long metal cylinders that provided direct access to the wrecks from above the surface. These are known as airlocks. An airlock is basically an underwater staircase where people can go from the surface of the sea down into 100 feet of water, totally dry, open a hatch into the bottom of the ship, and then go and do the work they're assigned to do. The first challenge was getting them attached to the ships. If you can imagine a long, towering metal tube swinging about on the end of a crane being lowered down onto a ship where there's a little diver waiting for this thing to come down. He's then got to fit, fit it to the deck. Cabling has to be put out. There are lots of different ways that can go wrong. Once the airlocks were fitted, a hole was cut in the hull of the ship, and enough air was forced in for the men to access the wreck. Then, work began inside the sunken ship. What was required was to subdivide these large warships into smaller sections by putting in using the existing bulkheads that were in the ship, but by making them airtight. So filling in all the holes, blocking up all the pipes, shutting all the doors. By pumping air into each section bit by bit, they could control how the ship ascended. It was an ingenious system, but there were always risks involved. The people on the airlocks, they were, they were about 20 feet above the sea to start with, and then suddenly they're about 150 feet above the sea and hanging on for dear life. And there were some jocular exchanges about what the hell's the use of giving me a life jacket and then shooting me 150 feet in the air. And when they were offered a parachute, I won't repeat the reply. <laughs> and all of this was accomplished with what by modern standards was very primitive equipment. 
This is the diving suit used by the divers that worked on the salvaging of the German fleet. Because you're down underwater, you have to have quite a lot of weights. Here's your breast weight at the front. There's another weight like that at the back. You've got weighted boots to keep you stable. The total of weights is about 80 kilograms, which is one hell of a lot to carry around. Look at the gloves. How would you like to do intricate work underwater wearing gloves like that? You've got to be pretty fit to do it in the first place. And you've got to be very unlikely to panic if things go wrong. Sadly, things did occasionally go wrong. Four men lost their lives during Cox's salvage operations. But in just seven years, the incredible ingenuity of Cox and his team raised 32 warships from the bottom of Scapa Flow. Their work left a unique archeological record, which Ennis is now able to see and document in incredible detail with his scanning equipment. We've been finding masts and other uh, small pieces of machinery. This is the German battleship Grosse Kurfürst. This is a very thick uh, foremast associated with this class of German battleship. And um, that's been left behind because obviously the ship has rolled over as a sunk and a mast has broken off and it's simply been left behind. I and mean, there's been no value to the salver, so it's survived. And 100 years later, along with the impression of where it was, where it was scuttled, we have its remains still there. By 1931, the price of scrap metal dropped and the Cox and Denks company called it a day. But this isn't the end of the salvaging story. Cox and Denks was bought by a company called Metal Industries. And their first target was the biggest battleship of them all. Ennis and the team are nearing the end of their survey of Scapa Flow. They've recorded the wrecks of some of the scuttled German fleet in incredible detail and are also constructing a unique picture of what happened to the ships that are no longer here. The multi-beam uh, that we've been doing in the fleet anchorage is, is showing us the, uh, the locations of all the major warships that were scuttled in 1919. And even the ones that are taken away have left a 100 year long uh, you know, mark in the seabed that we can very clearly see. And um, the one I've got here is a bayon um, that was uh, recovered. In one small picture, we've got the scuttle and the, uh, the uh, post-scuttling salvage activity together. In 1933, Metal Industries took on the challenge of raising the Bayern. But the scan suggests that it didn't go according to plan. And so what we have in this particular case is not only the impression of where the Bayon was scuttled, we also have, when it was recovered, the, uh, the turrets fell out. And they're very, very obvious. When the salvagers tried raising the Bayern, a pipe burst and she shot to the surface. Her gun turrets remained lodged in the seafloor. They resunk the Bayern to try again, creating the second imprint so visible on the scan. It's left this remarkable legacy behind the, uh, the turrets, which are a fantastic dive sites. Um, they're visited by a lot of the recreational divers that come to Orkney are mightily impressive. Despite the rocky start, Metal Industries kept salvaging and soon raised another four battleships. The salvage activity went on right up to the beginning of the Second World War when uh, the last battlecruiser Der Flinger was raised and it actually spent World War II here, where we are, very close to where we are right now, upside down. You could open the door into the hull of the ship, um, which is in the bottom of the ship, and you then, then climb down inside. I was, went out as a small boy, and I was allowed to do this. And it was fascinating, I mean, to be down inside this great ship. But the whole thing was covered in rust. The air was a little bit sort of musty. You know, it was just an, an eerie experience. In total, 
an incredible 38 vessels were salvaged from the bottom of Scapa Flow. My grandfather would be quite proud because after Cox left the scene, he was in sole charge of the whole operation. In the terms of marine salvage, nothing's ever approached it. And when you consider that initially people said they wouldn't raise a single ship. It was the most extraordinary salvage operation we'd ever, ever seen. Almost 400,000 tons of steel was brought back up from the flow. It was an incredible accomplishment. After being here a week, Ennis and the team are nearing the end of their survey. We've scanned somewhere around about 27 square kilometers and um, working night and day, we've had one night affected by bad weather. We've got a few corners that need to be filled in by limbo, um, but we've mapped the entire area of the, um, the scuttling and the, and the subsequent salvage. It's evident from what we've seen that the seabed is replete with evidence of what went on here 100 years ago. The data collected has allowed Ennis to produce the most detailed, accurate map of exactly what remains of the German high seas fleet in Scapa Flow. I think it's been an extraordinary week on a number of fronts. I mean, first and, and foremost, the most important thing that we've done is, is really uh, Innes's work on doing the most complete survey of the flow that's ever been done. Uh, and that will be fantastic for future uh, archaeology and for the protection of these, these wrecks or what's left of them. The scuttle and salvage of the German fleet is one of the most compelling stories in maritime history. A hundred years on, through technology and tenacity, Ennis and his colleagues have ensured that what happened on and under these famous waters will be studied and understood for at least another century.